Welcome to the second talk of our Women's Health Forum session, breakout session. Dr. Nancy Morioka Douglas is clinical professor of medicine at Stanford. She's also chief of Stanford Family Medicine. She serves as associate director of the Center for Geriatric Education, and she's interested in ethnogeriatrics, the culturally competent care of ethnic elders. This is the topic she will address today, ethnicity and aging, the challenge we face. Nancy. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just so pleased to see you all. I'm Dr. Nancy Morioka Douglas, and um, today I've been asked to speak to you about ethnicity and aging. So as you know, women outlive uh, men. In 2010, there were 22.7 million older women compared to 16.8 million older men. So issues about aging and health are relevant to all of us women. Among the aging population, I'm focusing on ethnic elders who have uh, specific risks. We know that ethnic elders are more at risk, not only with regard to socioeconomic issues, but also for chronic disease. And for those of you who were in the room before, cancer is now a chronic disease. And I'm sure most of you know that we anticipate that chronic disease is gonna be the thing that really drives the cost of healthcare, not only in America, but around the world. I'm, you know, I'm just not sure I remember this statistic correctly, but it's, I think that it's something like 40% of all private insurance payouts in sometime in a year in the early 2000s were paid out for issues around chronic health. So chronic disease is something we should all be aware of. Um, and for ethnic elders, they're more at risk for certain chronic diseases. For example, diabetes disproportionately affects the ethnic elder population. So as you listen today, I hope this brief overview will help provide you the context for thinking about some of these important issues. And for those of you who stick around, at the end I'm gonna give you a concrete tip that will help you uh, pre prevent chronic illness and continue to improve your health. So the reason I'm talking to you, to you today is from the work that I've done with the Stanford Geriatric Education Center. Um, we've been around for 23 years, and I was delighted that somebody who was a student early on in the genesis of the center came and introduced herself to me. She's taken the message that we taught and gone out and, and practiced and is now a physician in private practice. We've developed and provided training for multidisciplinary health professionals in the area of uh, ethnogeriatrics, which, as Linda said previously, is the culturally competent, sensitive, you know, it's hard to know what adjective to use, but we just try to help improve the care that we provide to ethnic elders. My mentor, the founder of the center, Dr. Gwen Yo, had coined the phrase the ethnogeriatric imperative. Now, in America, what we know is that in 2050, one out of five people in the U.S. will be 65 years or older. In fact, in this year, 2011, the first baby boomers, those people that graduated high school in 1964, will turn 65, and we're gonna be off and running on this huge expansion of elderly in America. The reason that we call this the um, ethnogeriatric imperative, though, and let's see if I know how to use this pointer, oh, there we go, is that if you look in 2000, most of the elders were um, white Americans. By 2050, when one out of five Americans will be elderly, of those one out of five, a third are gonna be ethnic elders. And so it's important to know a little bit more about the specific risks and um, issues around uh, being an ethnic elder in America. I included this slide just to remind me to uh, mention that, as I'm sure you all know, there is a lot more um, diversity within a class. And uh, the thing that I think of when I think about in-class diversity is, if you look here at uh, the category of American Indian Alaska Native, includes over 500 uh, tribes. And for those of you that weren't aware of this tremendous within-class diversity, any of you who went through the last census may remember 
the questions that they had when the census tried to incorporate recognition of great diversity into their questionnaire. So you may remember the complex wording that was used. Is the person of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin? No, not of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. Yes, Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicano. Yes, Puerto Rican. Yes, another Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. Print origin, for example, Argentinian, Colombian, Dominican, Nicaraguan, Salvadorian, Spaniard, and so on. So the Census Bureau, as it's collecting its data, is well aware of this within-group uh, diversity. And it is important because different of these subgroups have different risks. Now, many ethnic elders in America are American citizens born and raised in America. But in California, nearly one in three seniors is now foreign born according to a 2007 census survey. Many of those are called followers of children, uh, immigrant elders who come from different countries to follow their grown up children who are now working in the area. And while some of these older adults adapt easily to the US society and norms, many others do not. And this can create quite a few problems, which is what we attempt to bridge the training we provide at the Geriatric Education Center. Many ethnic elders in the largest populations are poorer, less well-educated, and have more chronic health conditions than the average older Americans. And I'll show you some data for that. They seem to have the same health conditions as their white counterparts, but often develop them at an earlier age and live with a chronic illness for a greater proportion of their lives, which, as you might imagine, significantly affects their lives. So what we know from a, a study done in, I believe, 2007 is that if you look at the immigrant elders in California, 16% of them lived below the poverty line, and another 24% of immigrant elderly are considered near poor, making a total of 40% of these immigrant elders who are um, near poor or poor. This is compared to 12% of native-born elders. So one of the reasons I'm even talking about this is to raise everybody's awareness about uh, specific problems that may occur for ethnic elders. And uh, one of them, you can see, start evolving with California budget cuts. So all of us are aware that California uh, state budget is in a pretty grave crisis. One of the areas they're looking at cutting is something called in-home supportive services, or IHSS. They provide in-home assistance to frail, lower-income seniors and people with disabilities so they can live safely at home. Now, this population is quite different than people that go to nursing homes. In nursing homes, the dominant ethnicity for people is white, but more than 60% of IHSS recipients aged 65 and older receiving care at home are from ethnic communities. And among them, about 49%, almost half, speak a language other than English at home. So you can see the effect of, a, of something that may happen from a state level and how it may disproportionately affect the ethnic elder population. Let's go on to look at some statistics, and I'll go through this very quickly. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, ethnic elders and their living situations. So if you look down at the bottom, you've got the total elderly population, white, black, Asian and Pacific Islander, and Hispanic. So the dark black is people that are older, well, older women who are living with spouses. And you can see that for the total, it's about even that um, half, uh, that you can see that, oh, well, my pointer seems to not be functioning. Anyway, you can see up here that half of them are living by themselves and half are living with uh, relatives. Uh, it holds across the white population. As you look at the African American population, you can see the number of people living by themselves increases. And Asian Pacific Islander, the ones living by themselves is less. Hispanic, again, it's less. This is probably because of the fact that we, as women, live longer than men. So let's look at the next slide, and you can see that this holds up that women outlive men. So the men, all this dark black line, all of them are more likely to be living with their spouses. So we women end up often living by ourselves compared to our male relatives and friends. 
What else do we know? We know that if you look at the level of people living in poverty, 65 and older, that you are more likely to live in poverty if you are not white, and you can see this. And we'll get back to what consequences living in poverty has. I'm sure they're obvious to all of you, but you can see that uh, for non-Hispanic black, uh, again, this is males and females, 65 and older, their rate of living in poverty is more than three times of non-Hispanic white. Literacy, so literacy is huge. It is the basic um, ability that allows us to access necessary services, all of which we'll need more of as we get older. And you can see that for Hispanic and Asian elders, there is a high percentage of people who speak little or no English. Education level. And education level really gets to health literacy. So you will read a lot about health literacy, the ability to really understand that patient education stuff that we're all given when we go to the doctor. Um, and we see a difference in education level for different ethnicities uh, compared to, again, non-Hispanic white. So non-Hispanic white, almost three quarters have a high school diploma or higher. And you can see that in contrast to the Hispanic elders when these people were surveyed. Um, this can have a big impact on one's ability to navigate an increasingly complex world in healthcare, particularly, I don't know how many of you have looked at your insurance, uh, EOB, explanation of benefits. I mean, even with a college degree, it's difficult to figure out. So let's turn now to diabetes as a um, kind of an example of a chronic illness that disproportionately affects ethnic elders. These are all people uh, 20 years and older, and you can see that diabetes does affect people that are uh, non-white more than um, non-Hispanic whites, but quite a bit, actually, because if you look at the, the percentages for American Indians and Alaska Natives, it's 17% uh, as compared to about 7%. This is just another way of looking at elderly uh, Medicare beneficiaries, people 65 and older, and it's very small, but the bottom line is that green line that you see at the bottom of every curve is the um, rate of diabetes for the elderly, and the other colored lines represent Asian in the aqua, Hispanic in the red, and black in the black. This get, breaks it down by women because this is a women's conference. And you can see that for um, black females compared to white females in the ages of 45 to 75 plus, again, being black increases your rate of having diabetes. And I always like to point out the fact that um, uh, in 75 and older, you actually see a decrease in rate. And that's probably because the people that are more vulnerable have already died. Here's another statistic about death rates and diabetes. Again, you see a difference in ethnicity, but I like this slide because it kind of is counterintuitive. You can see that, in fact, um, Asian and Hispanics have a lower death rate. Unfortunately, non-Hispanic blacks have a higher death rate. Again, this, this may just be that the people that were more vulnerable died and affected the uh, death rate. So we've talked very briefly about socioeconomic risks among ethnic elders. We've used diabetes as a model of chronic disease to which they are more vulnerable. And now let's talk a little bit about what one might counsel people to do to prevent diabetes or live with diabetes more successfully. If you look at elders, one of the things that we do at the Stanford Geriatric Education Center is we do a lot of training. And one of my colleagues is a uh, dietitian who's a nutrition professor at San Jose State University, Carolyn Fee. And she tells me that the influential factors to American diets, in other words, understanding if somebody from a different country is going to eat the way we do in America, and I know all of you are thinking, yeah, that's not so great. Well, I'll get to that in the next slide. But anyway, people that um, eat like Americans, we know that it's a function of length of residence in the United States, education level, ability to speak English. Other factors may include food availability, quality and cost. And interestingly, there's just an interesting aside that what people eat for breakfast provide the most evidence of dietary acculturation. I would be remiss, though, if I didn't just tell you as an aside about food availability and being elderly. Remember earlier on I told you about poverty as it applies to ethnic elders? I am 
always somewhat dismayed to find out that we have a technical term for being hungry. Those of you may already be aware of the term food insecurity. So food insecurity is defined as limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods or limited or uncertain ability to acquire acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways. You know, when I first read that definition, you know, I kind of, all of us sort of think about maybe mm, 15, 20 years ago, we heard about elders who were buying canned pet food as a way of supplementing their diet because they couldn't afford to eat people food. Now, you don't read about that very often, but make no mistake, it is still very much with us. Many older people living in poverty are at great risk of food insecurity. In 2002, in a national study, food insecurity was found in around one out of five black households, and one out of, or this is elderly, black elderly households, and one out of six Hispanic elderly households. This compares to about one out of 27, or 3% of uh, non-Hispanic white elderly households. So for those of you who have ethnic elders or anybody in, that you are hoping and helping to get healthy or to prevent chronic illness or live successfully with chronic illness, a lot of what I'm going to be telling you now comes from work that uh, Professor Kate Lorig at Stanford in the Stanford Patient Education Center has piloted. Uh, she's very interested in chronic illness and patient self-management. So, you know, I'm, I know that you all know that... Um, it's important to eat a healthy, low-fat diet, increase your complex carbohydrates. And this, you know, I was making a snide remark about the American diet on the prior slide, but this focus on a return to healthy foods. Some of you may have heard about um, people that talk about the Paleolithic diet. I hadn't heard about that until I prepared for this talk, but I guess that's like a caveman diet. But the research supports that um, going back to traditional diets for some ethnic populations may prevent some disease problems. For example, a traditional Hawaiian diet for 21 days produced improvements in weight loss, blood sugar and cholesterol levels among the native population. There are ongoing studies among Native Americans who have among the highest rate of obesity and diabetes that show that eating traditional foods, things like the cactus plants that are on the um, southwest deserts, anyway, those sorts of foods decrease their risk of developing obesity. Then we're all taught about portion size. So I think it's very difficult to know what an appropriate portion size is. So for that, Kate Lorig has devised a very simple way of knowing. If you look at a dinner plate, that's a circle, divided into quarters, and what she counsels people and the research validates that this is just fine as your portion control measure, divided into quarters, and a quarter should be your protein, a quarter should be your complex carbohydrate, and half should be vegetables. So if you're working with somebody who's elderly and you're trying to get them to eat a healthy diet, you can use that. Now, just the one caveat I would say about that vegetable thing is that many elderly people don't have great teeth. Often they're too embarrassed to mention it, and so that may be a rate-limiting factor with some of the raw vegetables. But as long as you are aware of it and can gently mention, well, you know, are there any foods that you have difficulty eating or are there any ones you prefer? you can kind of tease it out in terms of foods that are acceptable to them that meet the plate method. And so for those of you who are kind enough to stay through this whole presentation, now we'll get to something else that Kate Lorig and I work on, and that is action planning. So we started by talking about ethnic elders and their socioeconomic risks, segued into chronic illness, diabetes, prevention. And so one of the things that I can tell you for sure is that each of us strives to be healthy on a daily basis. But it's very difficult to translate that desire to eat healthy, do more exercise into what one actually does. I mean, I always talk to my patients about the fact that if our bodies did what our brains knew to do, we'd all be healthy. But it's that mind-body disconnect that's so disheartening. So this is a simple way of trying to get them on the same page. What I do, and I talk to patients about it, and for those of you who are interested in uh, seeing more about it, you can look at Kate Lorig's work. I actually use this action planning to teach high school students in East Palo Alto about how to be diabetes coaches um, as part of a research project, and I'm up for a national award from HHS that, uh, with this, so it does, I think it has a lot of promise. Anyway, 
What I'd like for you to do, each of you is you're sitting there now, is to think about something you'd like to do this coming week to be healthy. So think about just one thing you'd like to do this coming week to be healthy. And now focus it. Think about what specifically. So people will say, oh, I want to eat healthier. So what are you doing now? And what might you do? Mm, I don't eat enough vegetables. OK, so with the vegetable thing, what, what could you do? And so you just start being very, very specific. I know, I'll eat a salad for lunch. OK, that sounds good. What days of the week are you going to eat the salad? How many days in the week? Mm, OK, I'll eat a salad two days a week. Tuesday, Thursday, I'll eat a salad for lunch. Yeah, I'll do that. OK, so you've got your plan. It's very, very con concrete. It's eating a salad two days a week. And now this is the real, this is how you seal the deal, and this is what the research validates. So I didn't look well enough at the fine print on this to see that it, this bottom part is actually flawed. You don't say that 10 is the hardest. You tell yourself, OK, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being very likely, 10 is, yeah, I'm going to eat that salad Tuesday and Thursday, absolutely. And one is, eh, I don't know, I got a lunch meeting. They may have something I really like to eat. I'm not sure. Ask yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being very likely, how likely is it? The research shows that if you're able to make it a 7, you will do it. And then in a week, you can, you can ask yourself, OK, did I do it? Oh, I didn't do it. What were the barriers? What prevented me from doing it? Make another plan and do it. And week by week, you just kind of do little bite-sized pieces for these action plans. And the research is very strong that each of us that does this will enjoy improved health over time. So again, what one thing will you do this coming week to be healthy? Is it measurable? Is it specific? Is it something you'll know if you've done it? Number two, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being very likely, how likely is it? If it's not a 7, if it's 6, OK, why won't it be a 7? What can I do to make it a 7? Maybe I'll only eat salad one day a week. Hey, that's better than never eating salad. So again, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much for your attention, and I enjoyed talking to you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.